Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. I just got to wait for the screen to show up here. La, 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 la. All right. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Yeah, I don't know. It's probably because my channel is not the best. It's not professional. Yeah, Andrew, to answer your question, the reason why I can't delay it is because, remember, I don't have my own home. I don't have my own internet. Again, I'm at Child of God's home. We won't mention the location. Uh, some of you know who Child of God is from Pal Talk. Child of God is one of the dearest brothers to my heart. One of my best friends knew me before I was a believer. And we have deep love for each other by the grace of Jesus Christ, brothers of the same spirit, born of the spirit. I love this man. I love his family. Uh, a blessing in my life. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a tremendous blessing. Him and his family really love me for the sake of Jesus. And here he's allowing me to come to his home in his room. This is his room. You see his books. He's also a top-notch Bible teacher, an evangelist. And some of you know him already from Pell Talk. Child of God. He's a top-notch Bible teacher, evangelist, who loves Jesus Christ, right? And he really loves me for the sake of Jesus. So he's allowing me to come here and use his internet connection, which is perfect. His internet connection is much better than the internet connection of my brother's home. The quality is much better, right? And so I have to work around people's schedule, right, until I get my own place, until I get settled. And the Lord Jesus delivers me from these trials and provides my daily needs for the sake of my daughters. I have to take advantage of the time <clears throat> afforded to me. So right now, he had a window in which he could let me come and live stream for about two, three hours. But then he has things to do. I could have tried to done at my brother's place, but the connection is not the best. So that's why I couldn't do it later. Because I was just informed that DCCI, Hatun Tash, is having Dan... Baker, speak about direction of the Qibla. So if you guys want to go there and listen, because I do not like to compete with brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, because we're all in the same team. Hatun Tash, David Wood, Vocabulone, Christian Prince, we're all on the same team. So I don't like to start a live stream and compete with anyone else. I said, Dan Baker, Dan Gibson, I, that just tells you. <laughs> All right, this, this tells you, man, I hate, I got to stop drinking this dirty coffee because it's making my teeth coffee stained. And I got beautiful, gorgeous teeth. If you don't believe me, ask me, right? May the Father, may the Son, the Lord Jesus, may the Holy Spirit beatify us with the beauty of Jesus Christ, purify us and make us holy by the power of the Holy Spirit to conform to the image of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, again, we ask that you bless this session. Anoint us, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Fill us with life from your spirit, with love, passion, fruit from your spirit. Crucify our flesh, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Destroy the fruits of our flesh, Father. Cover us with the blood of Jesus. Purify us in the holy blood of Jesus Christ, your beloved. Cleanse us in the blood of Jesus Christ. And, Father, cleanse our loved ones, my daughters, my angels. Cover them. Wash them in the blood of Jesus. Seal them. Seal us by your spirit and save us from the world save us from the influence of satan and save us from our own fleshly desires father to walk in the victory of the cross of jesus and the life of the spirit fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the health i need with the breath of light to speak clearly father to speak accurately to recall scriptures correctly and interpret them for the glory of jesus by the power of the holy spirit and give us wisdom everyone here knowledge understanding to go deep into the word and then the power to live out your word perfectly and love your word and cherish your word, proclaim your word, not ashamed of your word, and even die for your word if necessary. Because your word is truth, the Holy Bible, and it's your voice to us. Have your way, Father. We love you. We need you. Have your way, Lord Jesus. We love you. We need you. You are the Father's heart. Have your way, Holy Spirit. We love you. We need you. Destroy all distractions of the enemy and strengthen us. And seal us for the glory of Jesus Christ and fight our battles for us because we cannot do it, Holy Spirit. We depend on you. Use this session for the glory of Jesus Christ. And beatify us, beatify me, and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Holy Spirit. Please. Everything perfect and good is from you. Everything else is from us. 
We trust in you in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. As I'm doing a live stream on my YouTube channel, I'm also airing this, broadcasting this in Child of God's Pal Talk Room. So there are a couple of faces that I'm seeing for the first time after a long time. Blue Penny, a precious sister in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if she recognizes my voice. I have not seen her in ages. Blue Penny, it's me, Sam Shimon. Lord Jesus, bless you, sister. It's good to see you again. Just to let Blue Penny know, uh-oh, Hater Wood is here. Blue Penny know, I'm not on Pal Talk anymore, but I'm on YouTube, Shamunian. That's my YouTube channel, S-H-A-M-O-U-N-I-A-N. Blue Penny, subscribe. Watch those sessions I've done that are archived there, and I try to go live every day. Good to see you, sister. God bless you. One of the original soldiers of Christ. Now, for the rest of you, guess who joined my live stream for about two minutes? Hater Wood, a.k.a. David Wood. Hater Wood. Now, this guy, when he does a live stream, he gets 1,000. I do a live stream. I can't even get 200. And you'd think he'd throw a dog a bone and tell people, hey, go to Sam Shamoon's YouTube channel. Even though it's prehistoric, even in Israel, he had to take a shot at my YouTube channel. Do you guys remember that video? He went into that cave and it said, reminded him of my YouTube channel. Man, this is the white man for you. It's a white man, right? And, you know, you know, it'd be nice, David, if you sent some of your 400,000 subscribers to subscribe and help this channel blow up for the glory of Jesus. But do pray for us next week. The A team, at least part of the A team, will be traveling to a theological conference. David Wood, Vocab Malone, Anthony Rogers, the Theological Beast, and myself. Pray for traveling mercies. Pray for protection. Pray for provision. Pray for purity, holiness, and that we'll be filled with the love of Jesus and that our bond will be stronger every time we meet for the glory of Jesus. All right. Are we ready? Are we ready? See? My subscribers, he says, only like quality content, not the nonsense you put out. Man, this dude invented the hater aid. Friend, put down the hater aid. Stop the hate. Participate. Come on now. Play, 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 play. Player, player, player. All right. We're going to go into a lot of meat today. We're going to go into a lot of meat. Now, I did not time it to start my live stream at the same time that Hatun Tash. Thank you, Sai Christian. And you know what, brother? It's ironic you said that, huh? Believe it or not, I have been bloated this week. It's ironic you noticed it. Man, you're a hater too. Sahi Christian should call himself Daif Christian. Keep praying. I lose more weight. I got 50 to go and keep it off and get healthy. And I got to pump up my, my pythons, brother, because we're going to be doing a series with Halal Hogan. Halal Hogan is going to meet Muhammad in the Muhammad's boom, boom room. And I'm going to be the black stone and a host of other things. What you going to do, brother? Halal Hogan, man. I am a real Assyrian. All right. Brother Joel, Glenn Davis, I'd rather hear his breath than smell his breath. His breath is one of the deadliest weapons known to man. And that's why he's not afraid of being attacked by Muslims, because he's ready. One whiff of his breath, and you'll wake up in Jannah, or you'll wake up in Jahannam, depending on your theological position. Right? Yeah. So, appreciate it. That's actually what I do, Christian Turk. I do like intermittent intermittent fasting, and I try to eat once, you know, once a day. Hey, Sai Christian, dude, the reason why my head can't shrink, Sai Christian, is because if it shrinks, that means my ability to recall scripture is going to disappear. So, do you want me to be skinny body and a big head so I can recall scripture, or you want my head to shrink too? You can have your cake and eat it too, Daif Christian, Daif. All right. Ready? Vine, everyone else, welcome. Hopefully, you get about 200. Okay, but we're going to go in depth in Isaiah. We're going to go into a lot of meat today because I'm getting tired of anti Trinitarian heretics in particular perverting the witness of John chapter 12 to deny that John's plain inspired statement is that the Jehovah God, 
that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6 it was none other than Jesus Christ in his pre-human existence. So let's begin trusting the Holy Spirit to guide the conversation for the glory of Christ. All right, too much. Okay, you ready? Yeah, okay, say Christian later. Let's first look at John 17, verse 5. John 17, verse 1. Uh, Vine, let me answer that objection real quick and thank the admins for joining us at the last minute. Praise God for the admins, especially first, last, and Protestant believer. At the last minute, they try to be ready for me, even though they got lives of their own, busy schedules, and families to take care of. So pray for them and bless them in Jesus' name. Vine, let me refute that objection. If someone tells you it's a vision, it doesn't count, then they just discounted the Mount of Transfiguration. And they discounted Paul's encounter with the risen Christ. Did you know that, Vine? Pray, Vine, that the Holy Spirit keeps filling me with wisdom, knowledge, understanding to plumb the depths of Scripture and then to interpret it correctly and live it out for the glory of Christ. Okay. Let me ex explain to you what I mean, Vine. At the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was transfigured. Moses and Elijah appeared. And God the Father appeared in a cloud. And descended upon Jesus, Peter, James, and John in a cloud. And they heard the Father's voice audibly, audibly tell them, audibly, out loud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. That's Matthew 17, verses 1 to 5. But now, let's look at what Jesus says in verse 9. Matthew 17, verse 9. Matthew 17, verse 9. No matter how much I try to beef up my shoulders, they're still narrow. That's genetics for you. Matthew 17, verse 9, Vine. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Now, Vine, who would argue that Peter, James, and John did not actually see Moses and Elijah, did not actually see the cloud descend, did not actually hear the voice of the Father audibly, and did not actually see Christ transfigured because Jesus called it a vision. I just need some water. Yes, you Thank you. No, sure. And also, bless child of God in his household by praying richly for him because he's allowing me here to live stream. Okay? So fine. Anyone tells you it's a vision and you say, and your point is, God himself says he'll speak to prophets in dreams and visions. Why would we discount a vision if it's a form of revelation? Now, let us see what Paul says about his encounter with Jesus Christ. Vine. He recounts his encounter with the risen Christ in Damascus in Syria, right? And then notice what he calls it, Vine, Matthew 26, 19. I'm sorry, Acts 26, 19, as the Holy Spirit enables me to recall Scripture correctly. Acts 26, 19. Notice what he calls... His encounter with the risen Jesus. Paul, notice what he calls it. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Vine, I did multi-part series refuting that canard that no one can see God. And even let's go with that, Vine. Do, do yourself a favor. Go back and listen to the series. I think I even titled it, Can No One See God? I think I did, was it, multi, what, three parts? I went in-depth, refuted that distortion of scripture but fine let's go with it can you show me any place in scripture where it says no one can see god except in a vision or a dream even when they're quoting the passages they're quoting the passage to say no one can see god period doesn't qualify it right can they cite a passage where it qualifies seeing god in that the authors say you cannot see god except in a dream or vision where do you find that qualification? Vine. Where do you find that qualification? And I go in depth on this, showing what those passages do not mean. So then why would they say, oh yeah, you can't see God except in a vision. You tell them, where does the passage you quote make that qualification? It says you cannot see God, period. But then you have a dilemma because all throughout people are seeing God, whether in dreams or visions or time and space, in time and space. Right? So none of those passages make that qualification that you cannot see God unless it's in a dream or vision. 
it says you can't see God. But plenty saw God in dreams and visions and in actual time and space. So then it cannot mean you cannot see God in any sense. And I go in depth in explaining even on the basis of the original languages. For example, Vine, John 1.18. I'll just real quickly, because this will be directly related to the point. Whom did Isaiah see? Okay. Let's look at John 1.18. This is the beauty, Vine, of being freed. From human tradition by the power of the Holy Spirit as he sanctifies you to think God's thoughts after him and then live for the glory of Jesus more passionately. You can let scripture speak and not muzzle it. Now watch this. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. Nowhere does it qualify it saying no man has seen God any time except in a dream or vision. Right? Now, what does it mean that no man has seen God at any time? Now, go back and look at the Greek lexicon vine. I'm not making it up. The Greek word can mean see with the visible eye or see with the mind's eyes. Perceive with your mind. Seeing with the eyes of your mind, with your understanding. That John 18 is not saying no one has seen God visibly or with their human eyes. But no one has perceived God, understood God, seen God with their mind's eyes, perceived God as he is. The last part of the verse, Vine, it says he hath declared him. The Greek word for he hath declared him, Vine, is the word where we get exegesis. Here, let me give you the Greek lexicon so you don't think I'm making it up. So now I'm going to explain to you what it doesn't mean and what it does mean. Right. Here, let me give you... Praise God for modern technology where everything is free, so we have no excuse for being ignorant of the scriptures. Yep, Xe Isatu. Okay, you saw that, right? Okay, fine. Now, if you go there, you click on the word for has seen. Okay, click on it. Let me give you the root. Here he goes. It's orao. Orao. Here you go, Vine. Okay. You go there, and guess what it says? Ora orao. I see, look, look upon, experience, perceive, discern, beware. Helps word studies. Hora'o. Properly see, often with metaphorical meaning, to see with the mind, i.e. spiritually see, i.e. perceive, with inward spiritual perception. So, Vine, you know what John 1.18 is not saying? It's not saying you cannot see God the Father or God the Son or God the Holy Spirit visibly. It's saying you cannot perceive, understand, fathom who God is, what he's like. You cannot comprehend the essence of God apart from the revelation of the word, who is Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. That's all John is saying in John 1.18. You got it? That's all he's saying. Now, if you want in-depth meat on this, go back and watch my multi-part series on this, where I prove from Scripture, not only Jesus, the Son, who is God, has been seen, the Holy Spirit has been seen divine, and God the Father has appeared visibly. And I prove it from Scripture. Even the Holy Spirit appeared visibly. And vine, the most obvious, is when the Holy Spirit appeared visibly in bodily shape like a dove. Luke chapter 3, verse 22, and John chapter 1, verses 32-33, he appeared in bodily shape as of a dove, and John the Baptist saw it. So, Vine, where do we get, where do we get that only Jesus can be seen, but the Father cannot be seen or has never been seen, or the Holy Spirit? That's right, Joel Glenn Davis. Joel, I highly encourage you, go listen to my multi-part multi series on my channel, and I've written articles on this. Joel, do not fall for, I don't want to call it a lie because some of these Christians are good intention, for the misunderstanding that God the Father cannot be seen, which is why Jesus is seen to make the Father known. That's. Let me tell you why that's bad. You are dishonoring the members of the Godhead when you say that. Let me explain why. Either the Father can't be seen because he's too holy and too transcendent 
which means the sun is less holy because he can be, be seen. So now you demean the son, dishonor the son by making him less than the father, right? Or it means the son is more loving and merciful and compassionate because he's willing to be seen, but the father is not willing. You understand this position is a direct assault against the essential equality of the members of the Godhead? Uh, Lola, do you want me to ban you? Because I'm going to end up showing you that all throughout the Old Testament, God the Father was seen, like in the book of Daniel, and he was also seen in Revelation. So when you tell me they didn't see God, they saw his flesh, that is a very stupid comment. Because you cannot see God as he is because God is invisible. So the only way you can see God is if he takes on a visible form. Please do not ch ch chime in or comment in ignorance because one thing about this channel you're going to learn real quick. I don't tolerate people who think they know scripture. I get rid of them. Okay? God by nature is invisible. There's nothing to see. God has to appear visibly in some shape, form of some kind for you to even know that's God standing before you. So you said nothing. So do not pontificate, chime in, for your own benefit. Even Fox Sound, when you say unlimited glory, let me explain this, because I already did a multi-part series on this, Fox Sound. Pay attention carefully. Okay. What do you mean glory? Well, sorry, sister. God bless you, and I love you for the sake of the Lord. But when you make that comment, it sounds like you're trying to deny the obvious. So remember one thing. I don't remember every face. There are regulars that I, I know. When someone comes in and starts pontificating, I don't know if they're trying to start trouble and debate. So, sister, I love you for the sake of Jesus. If you're saying the same thing, fine, but say it differently. Because honestly, the way you're saying it, will miscommunicate as if somehow Jesus on earth wasn't God. It's his humanity. Jesus is God in the flesh. When they're seeing Jesus, they're seeing God visibly. They're seeing him embodied because God by nature is invisible. There's nothing to see. So if God doesn't assume visibility, what is there to see? See, this is what I want you guys to understand. Let it sink in. Fox Allen. If God created time, space, place, and matter, think with me. That means God existed before time, before space, before matter, before place. That means God by nature has to be timeless, spaceless, placeless, immaterial, incorporeal. That means he has to be invisible. Because visibility is part of the time, space, material continuum. You with me? Prior to matter, prior to space and time... What visibility was there? Eunice, the vehicle that Jesus used to make God known is his humanity. You with me there? Okay, is everyone with me? Just before, because this is getting much deeper. This is why I keep telling you guys, go back, re-listen to the sessions until it becomes second nature. Because if I have to repeat the same things I've taught previously, then we're going to be here until the rapture. And we're never going to advance. Right? Exactly, Joel Glenn Davis. I love you, man. Joel, you're communicating the point perfectly. That means you're understanding it by the grace of God's spirit. Amazing, my brother. God bless you. May he increase you for his glory. Okay. Now, let me repeat the question so that you guys can get it. If God created time, space, place, matter, that means he existed before time, before space, before matter. That means he's timeless, spaceless, immaterial. That means by nature, he's got to be invisible because visibility is part of the material continuum, the time, space, matter continuum. You with me there? First and last is posting the links to my multi-part series. You with me there? So what's there to see? The Father by nature is invisible. The Son as God is invisible. The Holy Spirit by nature is invisible. What's there to see? Nothing. That's why Father, Son, Holy Spirit... 
take on visibility, visible forms and shapes, by which you know the one who's now appearing to you in that shape is God. Right? That's why our minds can't fully comprehend God because he's beyond our understanding. Let me explain what I mean. When we talk about personal distinctions, guys, listen to this because I'm not trying to get philosophical, but I want you to understand why God is beyond our ability to fully comprehend. And the more you think on God, the more baffled you'll be, the more bewildered you'll be, the more in awe you'll be of this God. Let me explain what I mean. When we think of personal distinctions, we distinguish persons and beings by the fact that we occupy space separately from one another. In other words, if child of God is standing next to me, you know he's not me because he has his own body, occupies his own space, right? His own place separate from me. You with me there? That's how you know I'm not him, he's not me. Because of the spatial distinctions, differentiation, right? You with me? Is it making sense before I move to the next point? God bless you, Psalm 23. May God prosper you for his glory. Subscribe to Psalm 23's channel because he downloads our videos to keep them going. The Lord bless this brother. He's doing his part in advancing the kingdom of Christ. So subscribe to his channel. All right, now, but God eternally exists as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit are three eternally distinct relationships. So that the Father loves the Son and the Spirit and communicates with the Son and the Spirit. The Son loves the Father and the Spirit and communicates with both. And the Spirit loves the Father and the Son and communicates with both. And these three eternally distinct relationships existed before time, space, place, and matter. But how do we differentiate them when they are not bodies that occupy space and place independently from each other? So how can we even distinguish them when they are not spatially separated or distinct because they don't occupy space, time, or place. Now try to figure that one out. Try to figure that one out. No, even fine. Put a revelation aside. I'm talking about as they exist within their own essence in intimate fellowship with one another prior to creation. They're not the same person. They're three eternally distinct relationships. But these three distinct persons or relationships are not spatially separate because they're spaceless, bodiless, placeless. But they're not the same person. To ask the question is to answer it. You can't answer it. That's why God says, there's nothing comparable to me. Who is my equal? I'm unlike anything in creation. Don't try to compare me to anything in creation. And my essence, my nature, my thoughts, my ways are beyond your ability to comprehend. Well, come on, 1611, that's an insult. He knew he messed up big time with that analogy. God forgive him, right? Okay. Is it clear now? So if the Father by nature is invisible, if the Son by nature is invisible, if the Holy Spirit by nature is invisible, what's there to see? When you say the unlimited glory of God, well, God by nature is invisible. And when you talk about God being unlimited, you can't be talking in terms of quantity spatially. I'll give you an example. When you say God is infinite, what do you mean infinite? Infinite in volume? Infinite in size? Well, God is spaceless, shapeless, formless, immaterial. So you cannot mean God is infinite in terms of mass, in terms of volume, in terms of size. Because God has no mass, has no volume, has no size. Right? You with me there? So even when they say, well, how can the infinite God fit in a physical body? That again shows that the person bringing the objection really is an ignoramus pretending to be intelligent. Because you know what I say? Wait, wait, wait. What do you mean God is infinite? Are you assuming he's that infinite mass? So how can you take infinite mass and squeeze it in a finite body? 
Well, that shows you that you have no idea what you're talking about. One means yes, Joel. Two means no. We have a pattern here for those who've been following me. One means yes, two means no. Don't ask me why I came up with that numbering system because I'm just like, as David Wood says, I'm the rain man of apologetics. I'm weird. You with me there? Okay, now coming back to the issue. Coming back to the issue. When they say, how can the infinite God become a man? Notice either their ignorance or dishonesty because they're defining infinite in respect to God in terms of volume, mass, quantity. But who said God is infinite in mass, in shape? Yes, something that's infinite in mass cannot be squeezed in, in a body because that body by necessity would, be, would have to be part of that infinite mass because infinite mass means it engulfs everything, right? So you understand what you mean and when, what you don't mean when you say that God is infinite? Dan Bitzel, that was my first public debate. A lot to be desired, but obviously you could see I was an angry person. I wasn't afraid, and I made few mistakes, but hey, this is my first debate. Everyone understood what I just said. Broken made beautiful ministries. Please do me a favor. Stop sounding like a Hindu pantheist and panentheist. I don't want to block you, please. Yeah. It's, it's there. You'll see it's a younger me, a fatter me, a more muscular me with more hair. My first public debate, you know, I, le I left a lot to be desired, but I'll let you be the judge. I would have answered some questions much better. Now imagine what I do to him right now after all these years, which he avoids me like the plague. He does. Okay, did everyone get that point? Yeah, broken mate, beautiful ministries. The point you're making sounds more Hindu than it does Christian. When he says, God says, you see me in everything. For a minute, I thought you're a Hindu guru, guru, right? Right? And the, and the butterflies and the flowers. For a minute, I thought you're going to have us do yoga and meditation. And start ch uh, chanting, um. Yeah. So you got me scared a little bit, brother. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, but you got me scared, Broken Made Beautiful Ministries. You scared me for a minute when you said butterflies and every you see me in everything. I'm like, uh-oh, brother's going to start chi chiming, and I'm going to have to break his internet connection. Hopefully, he'll then become beautiful. Anyway, coming back to the issue. With that said, with that said, everyone got it now? What we mean when we say God is infinite and what we don't mean? What we don't mean? We don't mean he's infinite in terms of mass and shape and volume. So when someone says, how can the infinite God be limited to a physical body? Why, why can't he? How are you defining the word infinite? Like infinite, you know, mass of, of liquid? Who, who says that God is infinite in terms of physicality or, you know, materially, spatially? No, by infinite, what we mean is God's attributes are perfect, complete. They don't decrease. They don't <clears throat> increase or decrease. They remain complete and perfect. Nothing can <clears throat> subtract from the perfection of his qualities or increase the perfection of his qualities. Right? So don't fall for that silly objection. So I, I got you. The infinite God squeezed in a body. Ha, 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 ha. Got you. No, you didn't get me. You're either an ignoramus, you think you know logic, or you're a deceiver, because who says that God's infinity is in terms of space, mass, and volume? So don't be impressed by philosophical arguments masquerading themselves as wisdom because God told you the wisdom of this world is foolishness to him and he raises up the foolish ones of the world to silence the wise men of this age. 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 to 31. And let's go to Colossians 2, verses 8 to 10.
I don't know what you mean change in the Godhead is hard to talk. You want me to adjust that too? Re Reword your question, Vine, because I didn't get it. But read Colossians 2, 8 to 10. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. Wow. Tell me the Bible doesn't have everything. For holiness, righteousness, worship, love, obedience, and knowledge of the true God. Notice Paul is telling you, beware lest any man spoil you, connive you, trick you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. Paul is not saying philosophy is evil. He's saying any philosophy that's based on human thinking, the thoughts of men, traditions of men, that is deceit, that is satanic, that is an attempt of the evil one to mislead you from the philosophy that comes from above revealed in Jesus, right? After the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. For in him, in Christ, in Christ, right? Dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything that's essential to being God, whatever makes God God, Jesus possesses it in its absolute fullness and perfection and has a physical body to boot. One of the clearest passages to the two natures of Christ. And then 10 says, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of principality and power. You know what that means? You lack nothing in Christ. Everything you need to know who God is, to know how to live, to escape the snares of the devil, to escape the wrath to come, to escape the corruptions of the world. It's yours in Jesus and his revelation that he gave us through his inspired emissaries who wrote it down in the Bible. You got it? Right? Okay. So be careful of philosophical arguments. Masquerading as wisdom. That's not based in the revelation of the triune God. Specifically in the revelation that Jesus Christ brought us. And revealed through his inspired apostles by the power of the Holy Spirit. That revelation being now preserved in the scriptures. Do you see why there is a concerted effort at discrediting the scriptures, destroying the scriptures, and your confidence in the scriptures? Because Satan knows if he can destroy your confidence in scriptures, that's it. It's over for you because you have no foundation for what to believe. If I destroy your confidence in scriptures, then you're open to anything and everything that the enemy hurls at you because you have no more confidence in what the Bible says. So who cares what it says? It's not truly God's word. And this assault against God's word started in the garden. Did God really say, Eve? And that same lie is repackaged today even by so-called Christian scholars. Well, we don't really know if Adam and Eve existed. And, you know, maybe the story of the flood, that was probably a myth that the Bible is par... You get it? And, you know, in the Gospel of John, we don't really know if that's what Jesus said. Because John is not giving us history. He's giving us theology. He's giving us his inspired interpretation of the meaning of Jesus. But if you had a camera and you're recording Jesus, it's highly doubtful that you'd hear Jesus say, I am the way and the truth of life. That's John telling you what he thinks Jesus means. You see, it's the same satanic lie. The same lie of the serpent repackaged to disarm you and to not hearing the voice of the serpent behind those cynical, critical remarks. You understand? Know the voice of your shepherd and distinguish the voice of the serpent. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd by the power of the spirit and are in love with his voice and cleave to his voice and will never Separate from the voice of the shepherd. But Satan tries to mimic the voice of the shepherd. And he'll use the mouthpiece of even so-called Christians. Because if a Christian says it, then that disarms you. After all, he's a Christian. He wouldn't deceive me. But little do you realize that he himself has been taken captive by the deceit of the enemy. And he doesn't know it. You 
You get it? Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. There are a lot of Christian scholars who have been deceived by the deceiver and bought into his lie, not knowing they're deceived and being used as an agent of deception. And that's the subtlety of the serpent. One of the best ways that he gets to disarm you is keeping you from realizing that you're being deceived and that now you're being used in, as an agent of that deception. That's one of his most powerful strategies and mastermind. You with me there? Let me repeat. Even well-intentioned Christians have been duped by the serpent, bought into his lies and deceit, and are now promulgating that those lies and deceit, not realizing that that's his intention to use them. Because after all, if a Christian tells you something, it's a greater likelihood that you will entertain it because it's coming from someone you consider to be a Christian authority. You see how subtle? If a Muslim says it, you don't listen. If a heretic says it, you don't listen. If a Joe, jo you already know to shut that down. But if a well-meaning Christian professing to be an evangelical or a Catholic or an Orthodox who says he worships the Trinity, that person you're, you'll more likely believe. And so you'll put the guards down. And if he says something that 100 years ago, liberal scholars were saying and conservatives were condemning, but now that conservative is now saying the same thing that that liberal of 100 years ago was saying and being condemned by the church, you start saying, well, wow, hold on. He is a Christian scholar after all. He is a brother in Christ. He does love Jesus. He loves the word. And if he says it, then it's got to be true because you do not realize that that Christian has been taken captive by the enemy in his love for attention and the acceptance of academia. Folks, don't deceive yourself. Even Christian scholars want the love, the attention, and the praise of liberal academia, of liberal critical biblical scholarship. They want that liberal scholar in Germany to recognize him or her as a bona fide scholar, so they'll make concessions to appease those scholars to be accepted in the scholarly guild. Are you with me there? You understand? Again, this is where I'm going to pr give praise where praise is due. I'm going to have to be honest because Proverbs 27 2 says, Let another man praise you, do not praise yourself. This again, and I know some of you may not agree with me. This again shows you, and now notice how Jesus Christ, Son of God, silenced this dog of Muhammad, this filthy, wicked, pagan kisser, because I'm about to praise James White. You see the son of Satan, father of Muhammad, who was Satan's firstborn? He thought he's going to cause division between me and James White, and he came at the perfect timing because I'm about to praise James White. This is where James White shines. This is where James White shines. Do you know why he shines? Because he's willing to buck academia. He's willing to cut against the grain. He's willing to criticize positions that the scholarly community accept, knowing that scholarly community will then reject him and not accept him in their guild. And he doesn't care because he wants to be true to what the scriptures teach as he understands them. So this Nur Khan, the son of Satan, like his prophet, you just got silenced by the true God, Jesus Christ, Muhammad's God and judge. You wicked agent of Satan. You thought you were going to come in here and cause division between my brother and I. Right? The timing was perfect. The timing was perfect. Anyway, with that as... An introduction. Can we go into the topic? Well, as I said, Vine, there are positions that are acceptable within orthodoxy 
And if you're a five-point Calvinist, Calvinist, that's fine. I know some people hate Calvinism thinking it's a satanic doctrine, but then you have people who think Arminianism is a satanic doctrine, and then you think there are people who think the brand of fundamental baptism, Baptist, I should say, not baptism, the brand of independent fundamental Baptist, that doctrine is a satanic doctrine because it promotes easy believism. So we got critics in every branch. In other words, you'll have an Arminian who may be extreme and say Calvinism is satanic, and you have a Calvinist who may be extreme who says any other gospel is satanic, including Arminian <clears throat> belief. And then you have the independent fundamental Baptist who consigns the Arminians and Calvinists to hell. And then you have Arminians and Calvinists who condemn the independent fundamental Baptist as promoting easy believism, cheap grace. And then you have all these groups attacking Catholicism as an antichrist system with the Pope being the antichrist. Not Armenian, the ethnicity. Armenian, the theological position. Not Armenians, the ethnicity. Armenian, the theological position. Named after Jacob Arminius. Why would I condemn an entire race of people? Tell what's wrong with you? Ask. All right. Okay. Can we not get into the topic? I didn't even get into the topic. And so, see, this is what happens with you guys. You ask me some excellent questions, and I don't even get into the topic. But I hope still what we discussed thus far was still a blessing from the Holy Spirit. Good, Joe Tink. Keep losing faith in Christian scholars. Keep. Because here's one thing. Let me make a final point. Final point. Protestants are quick to condemn, let's say, the Catholic Church because they have a papacy and a magisterium that they blindly follow. And they'll also attack the Orthodox for also believing in the College of Bishops and, and Cardinals, whatever position is, right, as their infallible guide. Little do they realize that Protestants have replaced the papacy, the magisterium, with the office of scholars. You have some Protestants who view scholars like William Lane Craig or Daniel Wallace or Gary Habermas or Mike Lacona as if they are the infallible magisterium of Protestantism. So before you look at the splinter in the Catholic eye, remove the beam from your eye because you guys, Protestants, evangelicals, Swear by your evangelical preachers and scholars as if they are the Pope, if they are the magis infallible magisterium, the papacy. And you know who you are. It may not be William Lane Craig, but it may be John MacArthur. It may be John Piper. It may be R.C. Sproul. It may be Greg Bonson, Cornelius Van Til. We're all guilty of elevating scholars and clergy to a higher status than they deserve and swearing allegiance to them in a manner that's unbefitting the majesty of Christ. God bless you. Jesus is the only Savior. Right? Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. <clears throat> we do benefit from scholars and authorities who spent their lives studying the scriptures and their historical background. But we never swear allegiance blindly to any of them, and we don't settle for just the word of any of them. Our prayer should be, let me repeat again. I sound like a broken record. I'm getting tired for you because I don't want to bore you. Our prayers should be, Holy Spirit, please. And you need to pray this from your heart, especially when you're alone. Holy Spirit, please. You are my God. You are my Lord. You are my love. You are my life. You're my creator, my sustainer, my provider, my maker, my fashioner, my savior, my redeemer. You, you are my all in all, my teacher, my guide, my sanctifier, preserver, one with the Father and the Son. Jesus said that you would guide the church into all truth. Jesus cannot lie and you cannot lie. Holy Spirit, I am yours. I give all of me to you. Own me, possess me. Every part of me from head to toe, flood me in your presence and guide me into all truth and give me the power to live that truth for the glory of Christ. Make me more like Christ and save me from error. 
Please, Holy Spirit, please, I beg you. And I pray that for all of us in Jesus' name. And if you pray it, the Spirit's going to do wonders. Why do you think I'm so open? So for, I listen, I folks, I have a freedom. I am free to share the scriptures to the best of my ability and tell you what they mean as I understand it, trusting the Spirit to guide me into truth and save me from error. Because I'm not bound to any denomination where I cannot say this. I can only say this. I have a freedom that many of you lack. I'm being honest with you. Now, don't get me wrong. If I have a weaker brother or sister, I'll be very sensitive how I go about communicating something that may scandalize them because they don't know better. Right? Are you listening to me? Our freedom of Christ cannot be used to cause weaker brothers, sisters to stumble because that's a misuse of freedom. Of freedom. So if there is a brother and sister in Christ, weaker in the faith, has been taught a particular doctrine all his or her life and will be scandalized by hearing another side, then you have to handle that person like a baby and be very careful how you communicate that truth. Right? So don't misunderstand me. Don't take the freedom in Christ as a license to cause weaker brothers and sisters to stumble. And case in point, I was at a Bible study yesterday. And a godly woman, an older woman with kids and grandchildren. I think she was in her late 60s, 70s. She was scandalized by hearing a different perspective on issues that she was taught by her priest that she thought was true. And by the grace of God, I handled it so gently because I saw her as my mother that I communicated gently and she was shocked. She goes, oh, wow. But this is what he told me all my life because she can't read, she can't write. She can't read, she can't write. She was dependent on the priest. And when I told her, well, this is what the Bible says, and I did it gently, she was in awe, shocked, because she thought, how can that be? But it's in the Bible. You're saying it. They're reading it. She was moved. But you know what that tells you about these so-called shepherds? She kept saying over and over again. She kept saying over and over again. But the priest told me this. I heard it from him. And all my life, this is what the priest said. This is what they told me. How, how can I know any better? I can't read or write. So I was trusting them. That was a reaction. That was the reaction. And her son and daughters were there. And I kept looking at the son. And I told the son, you see why these priests are going to be accountable? He goes, he was livid. He was angry. He goes, man, you don't know how angry I am. That here is my mother who can't read or write. And yet she trusted in these priests who are giving her information that's not biblical. I go, don't worry about it. I go, her sin will be on, on their head. Her sins will be in their hands. The Lord's going to call them accountable for, for what they taught her. Right? Clear? Can we now get into Isaiah? Can we get into Isaiah? What I want to demonstrate is that the Jehovah whose glory Isaiah beheld, the Jehovah whose glory Isaiah beheld, was actually Jesus Christ in his pre human existence. All right? Are you ready for the talk? And the reason why I wanted to discuss this is because I'm getting sick of Unitarian heretics, Arian heretics. Denying the plain reading of John chapter 12. Uh, see, now, when you make that comment, uh, Sam, I am, you know I'm going to block you, right? If the priests are teaching the Bible, then this young lady that I spoke with wouldn't have a view that was contrary to the Bible, contradicted the Bible, because she learned it from her priest. So don't be a know-it-all, because I'm going to silence you, Sam, I am, because I'm going to make you eat green eggs and ham. 
I mean, honestly, guys, and you wonder why I get angry with people. Could you read a more stupid comment than that? If the priests were teaching the Bible to this lady, then this lady would not have been shocked by the things I showed her from the Bible because they would have been teaching her the Bible, right? What kind of statement is that? Anyway. Okay, send this guy on his merry way. Send him back to the Vatican, right? Send him on to the Vatican. Okay, let's come back here. Are we ready now? Okay, let's begin. Let's go to John 17, verse 5. John 17, verse 5. Yeah, Sam, I am. Make sure you eat some green eggs and ham, right? And don't stumble on the steps in the Vatican. Okay. You can even tell by his name he was being mock he was mocking. Sam, I am. He's trying to mock. John 17, 5. Let's unpack this. Get ready for me. Get ready to be blown away. Get ready to be in awe, even more in awe, of the glory of the triumph God and that Jesus is truly Jehovah God in the flesh. Lola, you're a big girl. If you're afraid of someone calling your comments stupid, you need to then gird up your loins and be a good girl, I'm sure, You've heard worse in your lifetime. So saying that something is stupid, if that offends you, I'm sorry if I chip a nail. But if I chip a nail, then that's another reason to run to the local nail shop and get your nails done and polished. Anyway, John 17, verse 5. Let's focus. John 17, verse 5. <laughs> I'm going to make people hate me even more. Here I want to be loved. Where is the love? And yet, even though I'm looking for love, all I do is alienate people and antagonize people. And then I get comments. Brother, you're very rude. I don't think Jatha than you. Oh, really? Go to another channel. Bye-bye. All right, John 17, verse 5. And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Now, most people mistakenly assume that Jesus Christ here is speaking of the glory he had before the creation of all things. How many of you have misunderstood this passage to mean that? That when Jesus said, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. It's not about before the creation of all things. That it's referring to the creation of all things. Okay, no, it's not. It's not talking about the creation of all things. It's talking about the creation of the earth, the world that Jesus entered into. He's talking about the glory that he had with the Father before the creation of this world, this planet, this earth, not the creation of all things. Can I prove that to you? That when he says, the glory I had with you before the world was, He's not talking about the absolute creation of all things, heavens and earth. He's talking about the creation of this world. Walking in the light. Let me read it again because you're not listening. No, he's not talking about the, <clears throat> the glory yet before the creation of all things. Walking in the light. Pay attention. Let me repeat it again. He's talking about the creation of this world, this earth that he entered into and became flesh. Are you ready for the proof? John 16, 11, already got it. He got it. He posted it. John 16, 27 to 28. John 16, 27 to 28. So let me correct the misinformation or misinterpretation of that passage. John 16, 27, 28. He's not talking about the glory at before all creation came into being. He's talking about the glory I shared with you in heaven before the world was created. Because we believe the spiritual dimension called heaven, where angels dwell, was created first, right? And I'll prove that. John 16, 27, 28. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and I believe that I came out from God. I came, from the for, I came forth from the Father and came into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Okay, if the world means all creation, he's going to leave creation and go to the Father? Where? 
Where? I came into the world. But wait, if the world means all creation Protestant, including heaven, where is he going to? If he leaves the world, he leaves creation. If world means all creation. Are you getting it or no? Before I move to the next point. I came into the world. I'm going to leave the world. I came from the Father into the world. I'm going to leave the world and go to the Father. But we know where the Father is because he tells us in heaven. John 6, 38. John 6, 38. Yep, Jonathan Simon, you got it. John 6, 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Came down from heaven to do his will. John 6, 41, 42. We're going to get to that walking in the light. Just let's wait and be patient. Al Elvins, everything in time. Pray God gets me out of my trial November 20th and plants me. And I'll do that in time for the glory of Jesus. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Right? And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? But I thought he came down from God the Father. John 16, 27 says, I came from the Father, entered the world. I leave the world and go to the Father. But here it says, I came down from heaven. John 3, 13. John 3, 13. Yep, you got it growing. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So Jesus came down from heaven, came down from the Father into the world. He's leaving the world to go to the Father because he's going to go back to heaven. Okay, so my question is, how can the world mean all creation if he comes down from heaven into the world, comes down from the Father out of heaven into the world, and then leaves the world to go back to heaven to be with the Father? Red letter means the words of Jesus. You getting it now? You understand when he says, the glory I had with you before the world was. He's not saying the glory I shared with you before the creation of all things. The glory I shared with you in your presence before this earth was created in heaven. He's talking about the glory he had with the Father in heaven before the angels. Before I move on, I want to make sure you get it. He's talking about the glory he shared with the Father in heaven before the presence of angels, before the world was created. Because I want you to write this down and keep this in mind. Keep this in mind. The word glory is often used in the scriptures to mean something visible. Either a visible appearance of God or an action, an act, an event, something seen. That points to something about God. That highlights something about God. Like, for example, when manna came down from heaven, that act, which was visible and could be seen, revealed the glory of God. Or when God split the Red Sea. God, so glory has to do with a visible manifestation, expression, either of God himself or an action of God that tells us something about who or what God is. You with me there? So he's talking about a glory he shared with the Father that was visible to others that beheld that glory. Right? But what others could be beholding a glory before the earth was created? Angels. Because heaven was created and angels are created to dwell in heaven before the earth was fashioned, created. Let me prove that to you. Job 38, verses 4 to 7. Because you're going to see where I'm going with this. 
Job 38, verses 4 to 7. I hope this is sinking in. Notice God speaking to Job. Vine, everyone else. God speaking to Job. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. You weren't there because when there was no earth, there were no humans. Who hath laid the measures thereof, the measures of the earth, its foundation? If thou knowest. Do you know Job? Of course I don't know God. Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Guys, can I ask you a question? Who were these sons of God shouting for joy, beholding God, creating, fashioning the earth, and finishing it? There were no humans. There were no humans. There were no animals. There were no sea creatures, no marine life. When the earth was being fashioned, formed, established, and when God finished creating the earth, it says the sons of God rejoiced. Okay, let's look at Job 38 verse 7 one more time. God bless you, Psalm 33, 23. Let's look at Job 38 verse 7 one more time because I want you to catch the language. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Question, since Satan is not an earthly creature, he must be a heavenly creature. Here it says, when the earth was established, when the earth was fashioned and finished, when God now had finished the earth to make it habitable for life, it says, not some, all the sons of God shouted for joy. If Satan is not an earthly creature, but a heavenly one, that means he too must have been there observing God, creating the earth and making it habitable. Right? 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 So does it say some of the sons of God, many of the sons of God, most of the sons of God, or all the sons of God shouted for joy? That means by necessary inference, because the Bible doesn't come out, and spell everything black and white. You have to read the Bible carefully, prayerfully, right? And connect the dots and arrive at a conclusion and make a correct inference. If all the sons of God rejoiced, and Satan is not an earthly creature but a heavenly being, then he too was one of these sons of God, which means at this stage, Satan hadn't fallen from favor because he too rejoiced at seeing his God and creator Create a world for human beings to dwell in. Go back and listen to my series on what Satan was and what he wasn't. I don't want to repeat myself because I see some people repeating some of the same mistakes that I covered already. Vine, how can it be trembling when it says they shouted for joy and the morning star sang? It was a shout of elation. Reread it again. Job 38 verse 7. Job 38, verse 7. Satan only knew what God wanted him to know. And when God is creating the earth, I wouldn't be surprised if God is making his intention known. I'm creating the earth because I'm going to create human beings to dwell on it. Job 38, 7. Vine, pay attention to language. When the morning stars sang together, they were singing, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Where is the trembling? Where is the trembling? So this tells us that at least up to that point, when the earth was created and made ha habitable for biological life, Satan hadn't fallen, but rejoiced at the work of his creator in creating the earth. Sometimes I feel like hanging myself with shoestrings because of some of the questions. 
someone asked me, did Satan know God was going to create humans? And did God know that Satan would rebel? Okay. Vine, you got it? That all the sons of God were singing for joy? Pins and needles, Jade Rabbit. Needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Okay. Everyone with me there? Right? That all the sons of God rejoice. So by necessary inference, I'm teaching you how to interpret scripture and make correct inferences and come to correct conclusions. If all the sons of God rejoice after God had finished creating the earth and making it habitable for life, fitting for biological life, all forms of life on earth, for man to dwell on it, all the sons of God, and Satan is not an earthly creature, but a heavenly creature, then he must be included among the sons of God because it says all of them, not some of them, all of them rejoice. That means at this point, Satan hadn't rebelled. He was still righteous and delighted in his creator and what his creator was creating. Right? Clear? Before I move on? This guy, Pastino, is killing me because he keeps calling him Lucifer. <laughs> Pastino, do me a favor. Go back. Listen to my talk on Lucifer and Satan. I did a talk on it on my channel. Just listen to it carefully. I get discombobulated when people use that term after the studying I did about that issue. So when I hear Lucifer, my first reaction is correct it. No, 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 no. I can't go off topic. I can't go off topic. I can't go off topic. So what's the point here? Did I now establish that the glory that Jesus shared with the Father before the world began doesn't mean the glory he shared with the Father before all creation came into being? It's talking about a specific part of creation, the earth, the world. Before this earth was created, Jesus shared a glory with the Father before this earth was created. But before this earth, we know heaven existed and angels already existed. Right? You're going to see why I'm breaking this down because you're going to see where I'm going with this. You're going to see where I'm going with this. If you follow with me prayerfully, meditatively and slowly i don't know who's media if there's someone distracting the admins know what to do to block them salome what does the new heaven got to do with the heaven that exists now so there's no heaven now salome what are you smoking salome put down the pipe son okay everyone with me Before I move on, everyone with me, please don't make it harder than it is by going on tangents because I'm going to start blocking people. No tangents. Focus. Ask questions directly related to this because we're going to lose people if you keep going on tangents. Please help me to help you guys. I don't want you to get confused. If you understood the world that Jesus is referring to is the earth, but before the earth, there was this place, this dimension called heaven, where angels dwelt. He didn't say, the glory I had with you before creation, but before this particular part of creation, this earth was made. I was there, sharing in the same glory with you, but where? In heaven. Who was there to behold that glory that the Son shared with the Father? Was there anyone there beholding the glory that the Father and the Son shared in common. Yes, the angels in heaven. Do you see where I'm going with this now? If there was a heaven already, and angels existing in heaven already, before the earth was made, and Jesus is referring to the creation of this earth, I had a glory with you, Father, before this earth was created, the earth that I came into from heaven, 
because I came down from you out of heaven into this world. So the world can't mean all creation because it's distinguished from the heaven where Jesus was dwelling in with the Father that he came down from and will return to. Send Salom on his merry way. Get rid of this jerk. Everyone got it? So now here's the question. What did that glory that Jesus possessed look like? In other words, if we were there in heaven to see this glory that Jesus shared in common with the Father, what did that glory look like? And how can we know? That's where John 12, 37 to 41 comes in. Are we now ready? John 12, 37 to 41. Are we now ready? It took me a long time to get to this point. John 12, 37 to 41. Guys, this is where I really need you to read and pay attention to what's in front of you. But though he had done so many miracles, Jesus had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. The Jews would not believe on Jesus in spite of the miracles. Now, John explains why. Pay attention to the 841. That the saying of Esaias the prophet might be fulfilled. So John is saying the prophet Isaiah, over 700 years beforehand, prophesied that the Jews would reject Jesus. And he quotes Isaiah 53 verse 1. Notice what he quotes. Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who has believed it? The arm of the Lord has been revealed. And who's believing it? So Isaiah 53, 1 announced that the Jews will reject Jesus. That's what John is telling you. And he quotes Isaiah 53, verse 1 to prove it. But then he quotes something else. He quotes Isaiah 6, verse 10. Please pay attention. This is where the meat's going to come in. This is where you're going to get blown away. Okay? Therefore, they could not believe because that Esaias said again, and he quotes Isaiah again. This time he quotes Isaiah 6.10. He had blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. And then notice 41. These things said Esaias when he saw his glory and spake of him. Do you understand what John just said? John said the prophet Isaiah over 700 years before the birth of Jesus prophesied that Jesus, when he's revealed, the Jews will reject him. They would not believe because their hearts had been hardened because of their rebellion. And then he says that Isaiah wrote about Jesus because he saw the glory of Jesus. John 12, 41. Do you see it? These things said Esaias, these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and spake of him. This is going to connect with what Jesus said, Father, the glory I had with you before the creation of the world. Isaiah saw what that glory looked like because he saw Jesus in his glory and wrote about Jesus. And John is telling you, Isaiah saw Jesus and wrote about him, but where? Notice what he quoted, Isaiah 6.10. Quote Isaiah 6.10. Watch, wait, this is nothing. I'm going to have to do a part two because already it's 78 minutes into the session. Okay. Notice what he quoted. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed, right? You see what he quoted? This is what John quoted, Isaiah 6.10. And he said, Isaiah wrote this about Jesus because he saw the glory of Jesus. But wait, let's read Isaiah 6 in context. Let's read Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 5. Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord, Adonai, 
sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. Remember those two words, high and lifted up. Please remember those words because we're going to go back to them. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. And with twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. Uh, fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahovah, the Lord Jehovah of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah wrote this because he saw his glory and wrote about him. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, Jehovah of hosts. I saw Jehovah of hosts, the king, in his visible glory on his throne. I saw the glory of Jehovah. But John says that was Jesus whose glory Isaiah saw. Before I move on. Exactly, Riaz. Do you understand what John did in John 12, 40, 41? He took Isaiah 6, the temple vision, and said that Isaiah prophesied the Jews rejecting Jesus because their hearts had become hardened as part of their judgment. And the reason why Isaiah could write about the Jews rejecting Jesus, even though he prophesied over 700 years before Jesus was born, is because Isaiah saw Jesus in his glory on his throne 700 years earlier when in Isaiah 6, he writes down the vision he had of Jehovah, the king on the throne. That was Jesus Christ. Is it sinking in or no? Before I move on. So you see now how John 17, 5 makes sense. Jesus saying, Father, I shared alongside you in the same glory before the world was created in heaven before the angels who beheld the glory I had with you. And here Isaiah saw what the angels are seeing because he sees heaven, Jehovah God, the king on the throne and the seraphim, standing before the visible glory of Jehovah. So Isaiah was given a glimpse into the kind of glory that Jesus shared before he came into the world as a man, a glory that the angels in heaven beheld, a glory that identified him as Jehovah, the king to the angels. No, it doesn't close on Sunday. That's a misquotation of Isaiah 53. Do not parrot their misquotation. Don't ever do that again. No, not all manifestations of God in the Old Testament were manifestations of Jesus. This is why Romans 10, 9, I want to repeat it again like a broken record. Go back and listen to the multi-part series I did on God being seen. If you guys were to at least listen to me and go back and listen to these previous sessions and read these articles, you'll learn this stuff. But most of you don't go back to the archive and listen to these sessions. You only come when I do a new live stream and you're losing out. Right? Now, did you catch it? What was the glory that Jesus had in heaven before the world was created? What did that glory look like? I'm not sham. I know you guys don't mean any ill. Sham means I'm, I'm a fraud. 
I'm Sam, not Sham. Yeah, one more time. What was the glory that Jesus shared in with the Father in heaven before the world was created? And how do we know? How do we know? What was it? Only king on the throne? Okay. Nebuchadnezzar is a king on the throne, medic. This is why I say you suck as an apologist, buddy. But I still love you. King on a throne? Nebuchadnezzar is king on a throne. Doesn't say king of all kings. Disappointing. You guys still can't yet articulate what you just read. Riaz, I'll give you $20 million if you show me being worshipped by all creation. And if you don't, I'm going to have to block you for today's session. Why, why am got it? Closed on Sunday, got it. Jonathan Simon, got it. Because you guys don't pay attention, the rest of you. Why did we just waste time reading Isaiah 6? Exactly, medic. Suck lemons. Romans 10.9. You know you're going to have to leave now, right? Send Romans 10.9 out of here for today and he'll come back tomorrow. What does Hebrews 7.3 got to do my talk? Send them, please. Please, guys. Come on, admin. Quick. Vine, you got it. The glory that Jesus had and what that glory looked like, John tells you in John 12, 37 to 41, because there he says, Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus in his temple vision in Isaiah 6, where he saw Jehovah visibly, and he saw him with his own human eyes on the throne being worshipped by the seraphim. The glory that Jesus had in heaven before the world was created is the glory that identified him to the inhabitants of heaven as Jehovah, their king, creator, sustainer. It is the glory by which one realizes that this person in front of you is none other than Jehovah God. Are you catching it or no? Is it sinking in? But we got a problem if you're a Unitarian. Jesus said, this is the glory I had with the Father. John 17, 5. I got more. This is just beginning. I haven't even plumbed the depths yet. If this blew you away, wait till I go deeper. John 17, verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus says, I'm not the only one that possesses his glory. I possessed it with the Father. Okay, now here's where I'm going to get confused. If the glory that Jesus possessed is the glory that identifies him as Jehovah God, it's the glory by which those who see it realize that that one is Jehovah God, but he says, this glory is also possessed by another, the Father. But hold on, Jesus. If the glory you had identifies you as Jehovah God, and you're saying the Father had that same glory, that means that glory would also identify the Father as Jehovah God. But you're not the Father. You're two distinct persons. How can he possess the same glory, a glory which would identify both of you as Jehovah God if Jehovah is one? Sink it in or no? Is it sinking in or is it not sinking in? Okay, you want the answer? Isaiah gives you the answer and Paul does an Acts. Isaiah gives you the answer and Paul does an Acts. Isaiah 6 verse 8. Isaiah 6 verse 8. Get ready to be blown away, folks. Get ready to be blown away. Even though I've heard other Christians mention... John 12, that there, John is saying that Isaiah saw Jesus in Isaiah 6. 
I haven't seen them go as far as what I'm about to share with you, which I've shared in the past. Here's your trinity. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord, Adonai, saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Bam! Jehovah and his voice together send Isaiah for them. Wow. I heard the voice saying, so God's voice is speaking. The voice of God speaks as if God's voice is a person and says, whom shall I send? Who'll go for us? I, us. Who's the us? Jehovah and his voice. I, us. Who's the us? Jehovah and his voice. So when Isaiah saw Jehovah, he wasn't seeing a singular person. He was seeing the triune God, which is why John can say Isaiah saw Jesus in that vision, but it wasn't just Jesus he saw. He was seeing the Father as well. And according to Paul, you know who else Isaiah saw in this vision? The Holy Spirit. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that revelation? That according to the New Testament, the Jehovah God that Isaiah saw in visible glory, in visible form, on the throne to commission him was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay. But we got to read Isaiah 6, verses 8 to 10 carefully. Isaiah 6, verses 8 to 10 carefully. And I'm going to have to definitely do a part two. Isaiah 6, verses 8 to 10. Pay attention now. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, so God's voice says something. God's voice speaks. Whom shall I, the voice send, who will go for us? I, the voice, and Jehovah. Really? So wait, Vine. Isaiah went on behalf of the seraphim? Really? Quote a single passage where a prophet is sent on behalf of God and seraphim, cherubim, or angels. Doesn't work, Vine. But now read with me. Read with me. Isaiah says, Then said I, Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Now watch the response 9 and 10. You're going to have to pay attention to 9 and 10 or you're not going to get it. And he said, he, singular, said, go and tell the people, hear ye, indeed, but understand not. See ye, indeed, but perceive not. Make the hearts of this people fat and make their eyes heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Okay, can you remember what you just read in Isaiah 6 verses 9 and 10? Can you remember those words? Can you promise to remember those words? Promise? Okay. Well, if you can remember those words, Acts 28, 25 to 27. Acts 28, 25 to 27. Watch. Watch here. Let's see if you're going to make the connection. And when they argued, uh, that when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost. Notice what Paul says. Well spoke the Holy Spirit by Esaias the prophet unto our fathers, saying, well spoke the Holy Spirit when he said through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, and the Holy Spirit said this to Isaiah to say it to us. Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand. Seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their eyes are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Okay, I'm confused. That's Isaiah 6 verses 9 to 10, folks. That's Isaiah 6 verses 9 to 10. In the context, those words were uttered by the voice of Jehovah. But here, 
In Acts 28, 25, Paul says, these were the words of the Holy Spirit that he spoke to Isaiah to speak to the people. Did you guys get it or no? Yep, Roland. According to Paul, the Holy Spirit was there appearing visibly as Jehovah to Isaiah. Now it makes sense why the seraphim said, holy, 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 three times, not four times, not five times. <whistles> hmm. Isaiah 6, 3. Holy, holy, holy. Three times only? Hmm. Okay, but I'm, I'm really confused now. Isaiah 6, 3, Jade. The seraphim that were there before Jehovah said, holy, holy, holy. Not twice, not four times, not five times, not six times. Because the New Testament reveals the thrice holy is because that was the Father, the Son, His voice, and the Holy Spirit appearing. Okay, did you catch it or am I, am, am I making it up? Okay, let's let's do it again. According to John, we're not going to read it, but according to John 12, 37, 41, Isaiah prophesied that the Jews would reject Jesus. And the reason why Isaiah could prophesy about Jesus being rejected is because he said Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus when he wrote about him in Isaiah 6. So according to John, the Jehovah God on the throne that Isaiah saw with his eyes, that was Jesus. But according to Paul in Acts 28, 25 to 27, that was the Holy Spirit. But then Isaiah 6, 8, it says, The voice of Jehovah said, Whom shall I send who go for us? Vine. In of itself, thrice holy doesn't prove the Trinity. So notice I'm not using the weak argument, thrice holy proves the Trinity. Notice what I did. I already proved the Trinity is there and then explain now it makes sense why thrice holy. If all I used was thrice holy, 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 holy to prove the Trinity, that would be weak. You could say it is superlative. But that's not what I did. I showed you according to the New Testament, the Father's there, the Son is there, the Holy Spirit is there, explaining why it's thrice holy. Right? Now believe you and me, no academic, no Bible scholar, maybe even pastor, will accept what I just said. They'll laugh me as being a fanatic, a fundamentalist who sees the Trinity everywhere. And rightly so. See the Trinity everywhere. Because this book is produced by the triune God. Did it sink in thus far? Did it sink in? Now Isaiah 6, 8 takes a different meaning, doesn't it? Let's look at Isaiah 6, 8. Takes a different meaning, doesn't it? One more time. Muslim, you want me to send you to the Kaaba to smooch the black stone? Why are you here? To cause trouble if you don't want to accept or understand or agree. No one put a gun to your head to stay here, friend. Can I send you to Mecca free of charge? Isaiah 6, 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Does the us make sense now? Why is it I, the singularity of the Godhead? Why is it us? Because John told you Jesus was there. Paul told you the Holy Spirit was there. And if Jesus and the Holy Spirit was there, by golly, the Father's there too. And then Jesus told you in John 17, 5, the glory I had with you, Father, the glory I possess with you in heaven, as the angels beheld that glory, the glory you and I had in common, which the angels beheld and looked at before the world was created. You 
You see, I'm taking my sweet time for it to sink in. Because I want it to sink in because there's a lot more meat. I'm not done yet. Right? A lot more meat. But I'm not done yet, but I just want it to sink in. Selah, indeed. Selah, selah. We say three times. So if I asked you the question, whom did Isaiah see? Well, in Isaiah, it's Jehovah God. He saw visibly. He says, my eyes, my own visible human eyes, I saw Jehovah visibly on his throne. But then if I say in light of the New Testament, whom did he see? Whom did he see and who spoke with him and commissioned him? You know what your answer is from the New Testament? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. What do you mean? John 12 says it's the Son. Acts 28 says it's the Holy Spirit. But then in John 17, 5 says that Jesus and the Father possess the same glory together in heaven before the world began. Okay. I want to move on, but before I move on, I want to know if there's anyone confused thus far. Well, Angela, depending on the verdict, November 20th, unless Jesus intervenes and protects me from this wicked demonic judge, if she holds me in contempt, that means I, I'm going to have to be always looking over my shoulder, God forbid, because I don't need a warrant for legal fees that I did not accrue. So you got to pray against it that God will keep me safe so I can stay here and have freedom and not let Satan use her to try to hinder me. November 20th, next Wednesday, big date for me, guys. I need a miracle. In Jesus' name. Everyone got it? Anyone confused? If there's no one confused, I want to tie in Isaiah 53. Because he didn't just quote Isaiah 6.10 in John 12. John also quoted Isaiah 53. If you're ready, let's go back and revisit what John said. Yes, do press and pray for me. I'm doing that as well in Jesus' name. And ask the Lord to keep me pure, pure for his glory. Okay? Okay, now let's go back again to John 12. Let's look at 37 to 41 one more time. God bless you, 1611. Let's listen to the rest of it later. I'm going to have to do a part two because I can't make this a four-hour session. Okay, read with me. John 12, 37 to 41. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Esaias the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who had believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? That's Isaiah 53, verse 1. Then he says, and therefore they could not believe, because that Esaias said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. That's Isaiah 6.10. These things said Isaiah. Isaiah said the things he just said in Isaiah 6, as well as in Isaiah 53, when he saw his glory and spoke of him. The his is Jesus in the context. Yeah, but I have several articles on this. Okay. Okay, now, notice the first quotation John cited was Isaiah 53 verse 1, right? Isaiah 53, verse 1, right? That's the first quotation he cited. Let's look at it in context. Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 2. Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 2. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of Jehovah revealed? Now, guys, pay attention to who the servant is. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of a out of dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, and we and when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Pay attention to the pronouns. This is where I'm gonna need attentive readers. And two, the pronouns refer back to someone he mentioned in verse one. For he shall grow up before him, Jehovah, as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form. If you go back to verse one. The pronouns, he, refer to who? The arm of Jehovah. Pay attention. He shall grow up before him. Not the son, Becca. The word son is not there. 
for the love of the Lord. Do not introduce words into a text that's not there. Stop doing that. Because if there's a Jew here, he's going to tell you, Becca, where's the word son? Don't embarrass yourself. I'm trying to help you not to make these mistakes. Show me the word son. Okay. Go back to verse 1. The pronouns refer to the arm of the Lord. The arm of the Lord. Let's post it again. You guys in Paltok, are you getting bored with this? Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Arm of the Lord revealed. Now watch verse 2. Watch verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Go back to verse 1 to identify the antecedent of the pronouns. When it says he shall grow up as a tender plant, root out of dry ground, he hath no form, no beauty. Who is the he? Verse 1 tells you. The he is the arm of the Lord. Do you see that? The arm of the Lord is the servant that grows up before God and dies to save us. Did you get it? Are you seeing that Isaiah 53 verse 2, the pronouns are referring to the arm of the Lord in verse 1, so that the servant here is the very arm of Jehovah. He is the arm of Jehovah that becomes flesh. Are you getting it? And Vine, are you getting it? Because I went through this in previous sessions. And I'm going again, doing it again. Okay. If you're getting it, Isaiah 53, 11 to 12, who is the arm of Jehovah? Isaiah 53, 11 to 12. Who is the arm of Jehovah? You're going to be told right here. Isaiah 53, 11 to 12. Okay. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant, the arm of Jehovah is the servant, Jehovah's righteous servant, justify many, for she, he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Do you see who the arm of Jehovah is in the chapter? The arm of Jehovah is the servant of Jehovah, Jehovah's righteous servant who bears the sins of many, who makes intercession. You get it? So to whom has the arm of Jehovah been revealed? So if I ask you, who's the arm of Jehovah? The servant of Jehovah. He who grows up before Jehovah who bears the sins of many and makes intercession. Do you see it? This is the righteous servant of Jehovah who justifies many, makes them righteous, saves them, bears their sins and makes intercession, right? The servant makes intercession. The servant justifies many and the servant bears the sins of many. Did you catch that in Isaiah 53, 11 to 12? I don't need to repeat it, right? And you saw that in Isaiah 53, 1, that servant in that chapter is the arm of Jehovah. The arm of the Jehovah, Jehovah is the servant of Jehovah. The arm of Jehovah becomes flesh, becomes a human being to offer his life as a sin offering, to bear the sins of many, to justify many, and to make intercession. Right? Right? Okay, because here is where you're going to see something more amazing. Isaiah 59, 16. Isaiah 59, 16, verse 16.
Watch here, Ecclesiastes. It's going to get better. Isaiah 59, 16. Watch here. I want to do a part two again. And he saw, Jehovah saw, that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor, no one worthy to intercede. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness that sustained him. Now I'm really confused. In Isaiah 53, 12, it says the servant made intercession, but Isaiah 59, 16 says, Jehovah looked for someone, couldn't find anyone good enough, worthy enough to make intercession, so his own arm did it for him. Isaiah 63, verse 5. His arm did it for him. And his righteousness, my righteous servant. Now, Isaiah 63, verse 5. And I looked, and there was no none to help. Jehovah speaking. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. Okay, hold on. Isaiah, you confused me. Jehovah looked, couldn't find any human creature, no human being worthy to intercede, to save, to justify. Yeah. So he did it himself in his own arm. His own arm did it. Yeah. But wait, Isaiah, you just said in Isaiah 53, the servant of Jehovah, who's a human being, flesh and blood human being, a true human being. He justifies many. He bears the sins of many and makes intercession. But how can he, when you just said, Jehovah couldn't find anyone worthy enough, no human being good enough to do it. So Jehovah did in his own arm. Is there a contradiction? Why is there no contradiction? R Riaz, we know he's Jehovah, but he's called something specific. Why is there no contradiction? If Jehovah does it in his own arm, the arm of Jehovah does it because there's no human worthy enough to intercede and save. But Jehovah's servant is righteous and worthy enough to intercede, make intercession, to justify, bear the sins of many. Why is there no contradiction? Let's look at Isaiah 53 verses 1 to 2 again. You got to get it. If you don't get it, it's going to go over your head. Isaiah 53 verses 1 to 2 again. Why is there no contradiction? Jonathan, Simon, you got it. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of Jehovah revealed? Eugenio, he's going to post it. Prada's going to post it. And then verse 2, notice what it says. For he shall grow up before him. Did you catch it? Vine, everyone else? I don't know if you caught it. The reason why there's no contradiction, because Isaiah 53 began by identifying the servant as the arm of Jehovah. But according to Isaiah, Jehovah uses his own arm to do things when he can't find any creature worthy enough to do it for him. So then how can the righteous servant be a mere creature when he justifies many, bears the sins of many, makes intercession, none of which can be done by any mere human, by any creature, which is why Jehovah had to do it himself by his arm, using his arm. What's the answer now? Marion, you got it. The righteous servant is the arm of Jehovah. That's why there is no contradiction. Did you guys? I don't know if you caught it. The arm of Jehovah is the righteous servant. The righteous servant is the arm of Jehovah. So righteous servant is not a mere human creature. He is Jehovah's own arm that becomes flesh, which is why he is able to do what Jehovah said no creature can do. I don't know. If, are you cat? I don't know. You caught it? Hello? See, Protestant caught it. Notice Jesus is the arm of Jehovah, the voice of Jehovah. The angel of Jehovah, the word of Jehovah, all of which makes him the eternal God, Jehovah. Other references to the arm of Jehovah. Isaiah 52, 10. 
Isaiah 52, 10. Isaiah 52, verse 10. Yep, Pastino, I'm going to explain it in a minute. You're thinking biblically. God bless you. Isaiah 52, 10. Jehovah hath made bare his only arm in the eyes of all nations. All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. You got it. He has bared his holy arm. His only arm has now been seen. Why? Because this is the same chapter that introduces the servant of Jehovah. Isaiah 52, 13. The holy arm of Jehovah that's manifest is the servant of Jehovah. Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant. There you go. Who's your holy arm, Jehovah? My servant. But your holy arm is not a creature. It's not part of creation. No, it's not. But the servant is a human being. Yes, he is. But he's no mere human being. He is my eternal arm that becomes flesh to do what only God can do. Sinking in? You know, Isaiah prayed to the arm of Jehovah. You know, he prayed to the arm of Jehovah. Isaiah 51, verse 9, but we'll read 9 and 10 together. Yep, I'm going to get there, Riaz. He prayed to the arm of Jehovah. Notice Isaiah invoking the arm of Jehovah. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of Jehovah. Wait, 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 wait. Isaiah, why are you praying to the arm of Jehovah? What's wrong with you, man? Awake, awake. This is an invocation, a prayer. Put on strength, O arm of Jehovah. Awake as in the ancient days, like you did beforehand, O arm of Jehovah. In the generations of old, art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Sound familiar? The arm of Jehovah wounds the dragon. Jesus destroys Satan, who is the dragon. Art thou not... It which hath dried the sea. Wait, wait, wait. You dried the sea, O arm of Jehovah? Talking about the Exodus. You're the one that dried the sea in the Exodus at the time of Moses, O arm of Jehovah? Really? The waters of the great deep that hath made the depths of the sea away for the ransom to pass over. Okay, guys, help me understand it. Why is Isaiah praying to the arm of Jehovah? Why is he saying, arm of Jehovah, awake? It, to our defense salvation like you did in days ago. You're the one who wounds the dragon. You're the one who dried up the sea for the redeemed to walk in. You did that, O arm of Jehovah. Isaiah, what's wrong with you? Why are you praying to an arm? Because Isaiah is saying, dummy, this is no mere arm. Arm is a metaphor to refer to a divine person, inseparable from the Father, distinct from him who's fully God, that becomes flesh. What's wrong with you? That's what Isaiah is doing. So what does the arm of Jehovah do? Save God's people, vindicate God's people, and destroy God's enemies. <laughs> yeah, Isaiah, what's wrong with you? Ah, oh, but it gets better. Isaiah 51, 4 and 5. Isaiah 51, 4 and 5. It's going to get better. You got to do a part two tomorrow. Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation. For a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. Notice five. My righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth. And mine arms. Oh, he's got two arms. He's got two arms. Mine arms. What about your arms? <clears throat> shall judge the people. The isle shall wait upon me, and my own arm shall they trust. Wait, wait. Arm and arms. He's got two arms. One of whom is the servant. And guess who the other is? The Holy Spirit. The two arms of Jehovah. The servant, who's Jesus, and the other is the Holy Spirit. How do I know? Because what does the arm of Jehovah do? 
The arm of Jehovah saves. The arm of Jehovah delivers. The arm of Jehovah punishes, right? Isaiah 63, 14. Isaiah 63, 14. As a beast goeth down into the valley, the spirit of Jehovah caused him to rest. The spirit of Jehovah caused him to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. It's not about the exodus at the time of Moses. So wait. Okay. Isaiah, the arm of Jehovah dried up the Red Sea. Yeah. Jehovah has two arms. Yeah. The Holy Spirit gave Israel rest at the time of Moses. Yes. But then the arm of Jehovah is the righteous servant that becomes flesh to die to save our sins. Yes. And the New Testament says that righteous servant who's Jehovah's arm is Jesus. Yes. So Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the two arms of Jehovah. Yes. And the arms of Jehovah are eternal, not part of creation. Absolutely. Hmm. Wow. Is it sinking in? Did it sink in? Now, what does the arm of Jehovah mean? Obviously, Jehovah is not a physical being. He's not a physical being. He doesn't have physical arms. Arm is a metaphor. When we think of arm, we think of power and strength. Why? Because I can resist with my arm. I can pull with my arm. I can lift with my arm. I can strike with my arm. So arm is a metaphor for power and strength, right? 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 Okay. Now, the arm of Jehovah brings salvation, right? Jehovah's own arm works salvation, made intercession, brought justification, right? So the arm of Jehovah is the power of Jehovah, the strength of Jehovah, who brings salvation, correct? 1 Corinthians 1, 23 to 24. You got to add 23 too, Daryl. Don't be a nut. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 to 24. They say we're nuts. We don't know what we're, ta we're, we're talking about, guy. But we preach Christ crucified, crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. <whistles> so Christ and his cross is the power of God that brings salvation. Exactly what Isaiah 53 said. The servant who offers his soul as an asham, guilt offering, who justifies many, bears the sins of many, makes intercession, is the arm of Jehovah that brings salvation. Exactly what Paul just said. Sent Hamilcar back to Persia to lick the boots of the Ayatollah. Vine. Isaiah 51, 5, how many arms does Jehovah have? Isaiah 51, 5. One more time, post it for Vine. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and mine arms, more than one, arms shall judge the people. The isle shall wait upon me, and on mine arm, singular, shall they trust. So Jehovah has two arms. And notice the arms are mentioned in reference to salvation. Right, Vine? You with me there, Vine? So I want to make sure Vine is getting it. I need his response so we don't delay it. Vine, you there? You got to respond if you're asking a question, brother. Because I don't want to drag it. Did you doze off again? Okay. I don't know. Then ask a question and not respond. I don't get it. Okay. 
So yeah, yeah, it's okay. I don't know what happened to Vine. Yeah, okay. Vine, what's sorry? You asked the question. You got to answer. Isaiah 51, 5. How many arms does Jehovah have? One or two? My salvation has gone forth and mine arms. It's okay. We're going to wake him up by yelling at him. Arms. You see that in the connection of salvation? Arms. Right, Vine? Got to make sure you're getting it so I can end it because I got to end it. Okay. He dozed off again. Okay, so you got it too. All right. And the arms are used in reference to salvation. But then Jehovah said, no one was worthy enough to save. My arms in connection of salvation. Does the Holy Spirit save? Isaiah 63, 14, Vine. Isaiah 63, 14. God's arms are used to bring salvation, a work that no creature can perform, especially no human being. But now watch, Vine. Isaiah 63, 14. Isaiah 63, 14. I don't know why you put 13, Protestant believer. Protestant, I really want to see you and lay hands on you, brother, because I love you. As a beast go down into the valley, the spirit of Jehovah caused him to rest. So didst, I want to use my arm too. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. So, Vine, did you catch it? The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jehovah, gave God's people rest. And it's referring back to the Exodus. Your spirit gave them rest, a work of salvation. But Isaiah said, no creature, no human being was worthy, qualified to bring salvation or to justify. So Jehovah used his own arms. One of those arms is the righteous servant, a human being. The other arm is the Holy Spirit. Because for the Holy Spirit to be able to say, he cannot be a creature. He has to be one of the arms that Jehovah uses to bring about salvation. Airframe anytime. Did everyone get it now? So God willing, tomorrow's the weekend. If I have time to live stream, here's a fourth taste for tomorrow. Here's a fourth taste for tomorrow. More proof. That the suffering servant of Isaiah 52, verse 13 and 53, verse 12. The suffering servant is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, the arm of Jehovah, the eternal power of Jehovah, distinct from Jehovah, yet one with him. More proof. Let's look at Isaiah 52, 13. Just give you a foretaste of tomorrow. Isaiah 52, 13. Almost done. We're going to be done with this right after this. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. Those of you who have access to BibleHub.com, go back and look at the words exalted and extolled. He shall be exalted and extolled. Exalted and extolled. Let me give you the link. Tomorrow we're going to go end up God willing if I'm able to find a place to live stream. Okay. Exalted and extolled. Let me show you what the Hebrew words are. Here it is. BibleHub.com has an interlinear free of charge. It's phenomenal. You don't even need Bible software. Here you go. Oops, sorry. Okay. Exalted and extolled. Here you go. It's Nisa, right? Exalted Ram, Yarum from Ram. And what well, Nisa, Nisa. Ram, Nisa. Here's the link. Ram, Nisa. Here's the link. Okay. My servant will be exalted and extolled. You can also render it. My servant will be high and lifted up. High and lifted up. Those two words. High, lifted up. Exalted and extolled. From the Hebrew words, Ram, Nisa. Right? Check it out with Isaiah 6 verse 1. Isaiah 6 1. Four taste of tomorrow. Isaiah 6 1. It depends, Eugenio, if I have access to internet. Saturday, it's a weekend. People don't work. They spend time with their families. Okay? 
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high lifted up. There you go. Ram Nisa. Jehovah's throne is high lifted up. Ram Nisa. The servant will be high lifted up. Ram Nisa. The very language used to describe the exaltation of the servant is the language to describe Jehovah's throne on high. Did you catch it? Isaiah 52, 13. My servant will be exalted high, Ram, and extolled, lifted up. Ram Nisa. Isaiah 6, 1. The same two words used. The Lord on a throne, high, lifted up. Ram Nisa. Why did Isaiah use the same two words to describe the servant's exaltation after humbling himself to die a shameful death which are the very two words he used in his vision to describe the throne of Jehovah. Why? Why did he use that language? Because Isaiah is confirming John 17. Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you in your presence before the world was. Isaiah is saying the servant is being exalted to the glory that he had before he humbled himself to die a shameful death, because he is Jehovah, glorious on the throne, which he set aside to become the servant, and then is lifted up to that status again. Sai Christian means it in a good way. Sai Christian, do you understand that? Why? Because Jesus has blessed me with knowledge to glorify him. I can't just do anything and everything. And be open with anyone and everyone. Because I have a lot to lose and I never want to shame Jesus. Sai Christian. And you see why the attacks are vicious against me. Anyway, Lord willing, tomorrow, YM, YM, tell your husband, all glory to the child God, a sign of how real God is, how real the Father is, how real Jesus is, how real the Holy Spirit is, and that this book is his. I have no notes in front of me because early on the Lord made it known to me that he gifted me to be able to recall passages at will so that if I'm talking to you and you ask a question, the spirit in his power brings verses to my mind. Praise him for that gift. May he perfect that gift in me that I get stronger in it and become more faithful, more passionate love with Jesus, more holy, and use it for his glory more, not less. Save me from my flesh, become holier, and help me to get healthier and provide for me for the glory of Christ. No notes in front of me. I'm not lying to you. I'm not trying to boast. I'm not saying look amazing. No, I want you to be in awe of how real the Holy Spirit is. This is something the Holy Spirit is doing because he's all powerful. And he's more real than we can imagine because how in the world could I recall all this stuff? right? No way. I was terrible in school. I couldn't even make it in school because I couldn't sit long enough and study. And I dropped out of high school, got a GED, never been to college or seminary university, right? As a testimony of the power of the living God in us who trust him and yield to him, right? So, that's why I know the Lord has called me to full-time ministry because, worldly speaking, I have no skills. What would I do? So, Lord willing, I'll try to do part two on Isaiah 52, 13. There's a lot more meat, and I have a lot to do. But, guys, big, big day Wednesday. This wicked, satanic judge, a judge from Satan, if this wicked judge, being filthy and wicked, wants to hold me in contempt because I can't be in court. My Lord's going to go there and say, can't be there. He lives in another state. She, she may hold me in contempt for legal fees, not even a crime. Legal fees that I don't owe, my ex-wife owes, but that she put on me. I need miraculous intervention that the Lord will keep me here, destroy this debt, provide for me and my children, and no contempt because I can't have a warrant on me for something stupid. I need... 
to be free to travel to glorify Christ. So pray for traveling mercies next week. David and I and two others are going to be going to a conference. Pray for traveling mercies, protection and favor and provision. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is the eternal arm of Jehovah, the eternal voice of Jehovah, the messenger, angel of Jehovah is not a creature, the son of the father, his heart who became flesh, one with the father, one with the spirit. He's our God and savior, the one whom Isaiah saw on the throne as Jehovah God almighty. May he come sooner than later and may we, may we be clothed in his righteousness, sealed by his spirit, washed in his blood, and may the Lord Jesus wash our loved ones, my daughters, in his blood, and seal them and seal all of us by his spirit. We love you, Lord Jesus. Please save us. Maranatha, in Jesus' name. And guys, pray for me. Weekends are very hard because I'm in a new state all by myself. Everyone is with their families and kids, and my kids are somewhere else, and I haven't seen them. And I got to be honest, it's, it's hard. It's very hard. I'm very lonely without them. Pray for the provision. Pray for protection. Pray for good news. Okay, Christ loves you more than you can imagine. And I pray that we love him in return. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care.